and Colin's going to talk about social networking within Moodle as a tool for teaching and learning. Okay, thank you, Colin. Hello, my name's Colin Herring. I'm basically today I'm going to talk about two projects. I'm going to talk about a project that I'm actually running within UWE and I'm going to talk about another project that's to do with um, a school on the Wirral, a secondary school. But the thing that's really, really come to mind when I've been doing the research this year into, into e-learning is, is the fact that there's more factors to, to do with the, the adoption than the technology actually approaches. One of the big problems we have as technologists, and I'm, I'm a senior lecturer in, in um, sound technology, one of, one of my biggest failings is that I tend to go off on a tangent with technology and I forget about the things that are really important, which is the pedagogy, and it's the actual learning that's the important aspect. We fellowship then. First of all, it was to assess the current position of e-learning at Newey. Well, that was quite simple, to, to just do a questionnaire and find out how people were actually using it. And then it was to the hard bit, to pilot pilots appropriate approaches to inform developmental strategy. But then, the next bit which was, was, was the even more difficult bit, and that was to investigate the, the cultural factors about the adoption of technology. But then when I started looking into it and started seeing the problems that other colleagues were facing to try and get over this curve of learning, this steep curve of learning, to actually adopt new technologies, it started to become more apparent to me that we needed to work in a different way. The culture of adoption of technology can be uh, described in any sort of technology. You could look at a video recorder, you could look at the internet, you could look at the car. All of these different technologies, when they were first introduced, faced opposition from people in the status quo. The status quo, this resistance to change, has got to be factored in any sort of institutional change. So that was another factor we were looking into. But then the next bit was to develop a roadmap for the dissemination of good practice and the encouragement of the adoption of e-learning. The adoption of web technologies was already a saturation, so our department, with heavy users of the web, with heavy users of email, and all the things that I've grew up as an academic to expect people to be into, all the things, that, like I say, in my comfort zone. But then, in January, I read a report which was called Their Space, and as, as you can see on there, it's published by uh, an organisation called Demos or Demos. The thing about this report was this, this was the report that really whet my appetite for looking at the way people use the web now compared to how they used to use it. And the whole, the whole sort of ethos of the report, the main point is that they studied uh, teenagers' use of the internet and web technologies and actually looked for trends in the usage of communication and the communication that they do compared to, the, to like an, old, an old academic like me, 40 odd years of age, is a different world. And I've always knew this, but it, it took it, the report to show me in black and white the differences for me to start to get a feel of where we may be going wrong as academics with the actual learning outcomes and the way that we pre present information and communication. One of the points it makes is that uh, kids of 14 and 15 don't tend to use email. They don't use email because it takes too long. They'd rather use MSN, they'd rather use instant messages, SMS on a phone. Now that's pretty obvious, but think about the implications as an academic sitting in your office and then you've got to contact your students. You send an all students email out and then wonder why only five of them respond. Because most of them will probably have email as a very low priority in the communication chain. So. The, the email communication is a thing of the past that belongs in our generation, even though we feel that we're being quite cut edge using it. It's not, not the way it is with, with youngsters. I started looking at the research that I was doing across Newey, and I realised the limitations. Because I was stuck in the old paradigm, I was stuck in the old mindset, and what I really needed was access to people from a younger generation to try and look at the way they communicate now, to try and plan the strategy for the future for our type of communication and web delivery. So, I got in touch with a, a school that I know, and it's on the Wirral, it's Wirral Grammar School for Girls. It's a specialist language college. To give you an idea what happened, I, I, I managed to talk the um, French department into giving me a trial. Now, the other thing that was attractive about this school was they hadn't had a VLE at this point. And I, the first thing I did was do a survey to find out how they communicated, to try and see if it matched this, this document that I'd read. 18 of them out of the 19 cited MSN as primary communication. The first point of communication with their peer group and friends was they went on MSN. And that to me blew me away. It all fitted into place. This language barrier, my generation, couldn't communicate. There's got to be a paradigm shift to take the communication back to the level we need to deliver the goods. Also, 15 of them maintained a personal website. Now, this could be anything from a MySpace, you know, a Facebook, 
uh, any of these sort of like web two uh, technologies that the kids are all getting into now. Um, nine of them used internet resources as, as a first call for homework. So the library was out of the question. They wanted the immediacy of the internet, which as an educator is, is quite frightening, and especially when they start saying they're using Wikipedia. And that, the, the thing that dawns on me though is you can either kick up a fuss and you can say, right, this isn't right, you shouldn't be doing this. Or you can try and provide better resources that are more verifiable to actually increase the learning potential. Now that to me seemed like the better way of doing it. We progressed from there and then we started developing the BLE. And I was very interested in this whole concept of this constructionism and how you can how you can take a group of people and they can get strength from the group to increase the learning and teaching potential. So we were going to give ownership to the group. It became apparent very early on that for these social networks to work, the group had to perceive it was theirs. Now, we let the group evolve its own rules and value system. Again, this is all to do with the social cohesion of the network. If the rules are theirs and the values are theirs, they'll feel party to it and they'll want to take part, they'll want to engage. So we had to come up with a policy to keep some sort of rein on it, to make sure that the kids couldn't go too mad and there was not going to be any academic risk or institutional risk to the school. And the next thing was to let the group decide upon the name. The teachers, when they seen the name, said no, no possibility at all, you can't use that name. But then, when we started to debate it, and I sat with the teachers and discussed it, I said, look, we're going into this with our eyes open. We've got to make it so that the kids have got ownership. Frog's Legs was born, and the kids decided that was going to be the name of their Moodle site, and that's the actual top banner off the site. That the kids designed themselves and come up with the, the artwork, and that's, that's how they wanted it. We started moving on and started to look at, to concentrate on communication, keep the forum vibrant. The site was completely in French. There was no English to be spoken on the site at all. So, from a teaching perspective, the teachers could argue that the grammar skills and the written skills were going to be the, 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 the main claim of, of any benefit on the site. And then all of a sudden, it went from being a forum entry to an instant message entry. And the teacher didn't know this was happening. So what started to happen was, I got instant message, instant message, instant message, because the kids suddenly realised they could send messages to each other without the teacher knowing. I thought, what's going to happen here? So I opened a few of them up, and the funniest thing was, it was all in French. So they were talking behind the teacher's back in French. Now that might be a one-off for this school, but for me, it showed that the tool was starting to work. So what we found was really interested in this one, was we could get news items from French media websites, and all of those would be in French. So the kids were constantly exposed to the French media every time they logged in. The other advantage of this from a teaching and learning perspective was that the kids were attracted back to the site because the content changed on a daily basis. Right, from the teacher's perspective, I've been pleasantly surprised to see that the quiet introverts of the group are clearly growing in confidence with their peers. The environment encourages their participation without the usual pressure they might feel in face-to-face -face discussions. And it's a precious moment indeed for any teacher to see their students getting energetically involved in a virtual conversation class in the middle of a half-term holiday. Now, this raises other issues, we've got no time for it today, but teachers, right from students' perspective, all participants felt they improved the cohesion of the group, most reports an increase in confidence through the written communication, many appreciated the dynamic links, and all students wanted to continue with Moodle as a learning resource. So, how does this work with us? Well, come back to the original research, which is in your page G. By getting a user base that are used to using a particular platform is obviously an advantage for a HE provider. As the users come through, you've not got to retrain them or reskill them in other environments. Um, social networking is a key to adoption. To get the, the actual group to cohere, cohere and, and actually start working together, the tools are there for doing that. And the design of enhancements of communication, what we've decided to do, there's, there's a few um, SMS packages you can get for Moodle. We've actually wrote our own gateway that we're going to release as a module for everyone to use that will use standard uh, gateway protocols for SMS to make you be able to use group text functions like you can use group email. Also, we're going to do a major project to link student services to the VLE. What we're going to do, we're going to look at people who are asking for help, maybe for specific learning needs, and ways that we can interrogate the database behind Moodle to look at the communication aspects like lurking on forums or using forums, and actually use them as performance indicators to tie the whole package together so we get a, a holistic view of the student's academic health. And obviously that's going to hopefully increase retention and all the other bits that go with it.